right, so we're going to move into today's topic, which is hypertension, and introduce Dr. Elam Siddiqui. Uh, this is their first Doctors In program with us, so be, be kind. Um, and, but this is obviously an important topic, um, so I'm happy to see you all here to, to learn more. And so please welcome Dr. Siddiqui. Hi everyone, as you know, um, I'm Ilham, thank you for the introduction, and we're here to have basically a discussion about hypertension. All right, so feel free to stop me, ask me questions as we're going along. I will do my best to answer them. Also, at the end of the presentation and the talk, we do have some blood pressure cuffs, and we're happy to check your blood pressures before you leave if anyone wants to do that, okay? All right. All right, so let's get started. So. You guys have all heard the term hypertension, right? What does that mean? Anyone? Yeah, that's great. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> hypertension means high blood pressure. I thought they were two different things. Hypertension is just the medical name for what we call high blood pressure. So, okay. I mean, they say, uh, they say, they say kids have hypertension, mm -hmm. but they don't have high blood pressure. It's the same thing. Oh, okay. Yep. So it's two different ways of saying the same thing, okay? So what is blood pressure, right? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, anyone want to try to answer that one? Uh, Go for it. The heart sending blood to the brain and the body. Excellent. That's, that's really good. So what, as you see, there's a picture on the board. Pick your, pick your PowerPoint presentation, I guess. There's three in here. It's making me dizzy. So in the, in the middle of that picture, you see what we call, what we see is our heart. And out of the heart, we see lots of different vessels, which are known as arteries, that branch off of our heart and supply different areas of our body, right? So the heart is a pump, and it pumps blood through your body and away from your heart. So what is blood pressure? It's actually a measure of how hard the blood is pushing against the walls of those arteries, okay? Anyone have questions about that? All right. So that leads us into, well, how does high blood pressure develop, right? And for us to know how it develops, we should talk about the fact that there are two different kinds of blood pressure. One is primary hypertension, and the second is called secondary hypertension. So with primary hypertension, there's no known single cause that causes it, but we do know that this is something that develops over years gradually, and we think it's linked to genetics, poor diet, lack of exercise, and obesity. The second form of hypertension we can usually say is a result of another medical condition that you're already dealing with. Um, how many of you guys have heard of sleep apnea? Yeah, okay. So sleep apnea is a condition that can contribute to high blood pressures. Um, people who suffer from different kinds of kidney illnesses can also have high blood pressure. People who have um, illnesses related to their thyroid, particularly an overactive thyroid, may have high blood pressure. There's a lot of different kinds of medications that can contribute to high blood pressure. Sometimes we go to the drugstore and pick out some over-the-counter medications that we think will help us with our cough and our allergies and our colds, and sometimes those medications contain specific medications that can contribute to elevated blood pressures. Um, some pain medications over-the-counter, things like Motrin, Ibuprofen, Advil, can contribute to elevated blood pressures. And Certain prescription medications like contraceptives, birth control pills, can also contribute to elevated blood pressures. And then we obviously, ha go ahead. What do you mean by elevated blood pressure? High blood pressures. High blood pressure? Yep. So those medications can increase our blood pressures. I've been taking Motrin and I never have had it high. Yeah, so intermittent use, occasional use should not contribute to elevated blood pressures. <laughs> Good question. Sometimes patients will take excessive amounts of these medications that can damage our kidneys and in, re in, in return cause high blood pressures. But if you're taking it every now and then, nothing to worry about, okay? Um, and then that gets to my last bullet there, illegal drug, sorry, yes, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I was going to say, um, I had heard before that ibuprofen and Advil can lead to a stroke, does that tie in as well with 
Um, so Advil and Motrin, what they do is they serve to thin the blood a little bit. So um, probably not directly related to causing a stroke, but if your blood is thinned out to a certain degree because you're using these medications, so let's say um, that may, if it's thinned out to a certain extent, that may be a risk factor for, for having a type of stroke that causes blood in your brain. Okay, okay. you're welcome. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, the, we also worry about illegal drug use, such as coca cocaine and amphetamines, which can lead to high blood pressure as well. Okay. Any questions about these? What about cigarettes and marijuana? I'm going to get to, I'm, that's a good question, and I'm going to get to that in a, in a later slide. Okay? All right. So now we're going to talk about what are some risk factors that contribute to developing high blood pressure. Can you guys think of things that might um, make it uh, give you a higher chance of developing higher blood pressure? Okay. Good. Good. People. People. That, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I can see that one. Sedentary lifestyle. Excellent. Fat food. Good. Stress, AKA Excellent, exactly, I, I agree with that one. Um, anything else you guys can think of? What about cultural factors, like a certain ethnic groups more susceptible to Absolutely, that absolutely, and I'm gonna talk about that, absolutely. Excuse me? I didn't hear you, I'm so sorry. A roach on the floor. A roach on the floor. Yeah, because I caused the stress. I would be screaming, my blood pressure would shoot straight through the roof, absolutely. <laughs> Question, why do everything have to be a culture factor, okay? I'm African-American, all right? Some people in my family have high blood pressure, mm -hmm. and some people don't. Right. But I don't. I have low blood pressure. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's not everyone who's African-American is going to have high blood pressure. But a lot of studies that have been done um, show that there might be certain risks in African-American patients that contribute to the development of higher blood pressure. So just because you're African American doesn't mean that you're going to have high blood pressure, but there are certain things that being African American may predispo predispose you to developing hypertension. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So, so that's, that's for like anyone. What do you mean? As, as far as um, high blood pressure. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in particularly. I was going to ask you if you mean certain things like some people were raised as African American or even indigenous people who were raised, okay, you can eat pork, but pork it can lead people to higher elevations of lots of, you know, risks. Like, I'm indigenous, but instead of getting high blood pressure, I have edema, that's because I'm low in salt. Mm. So with that, I had to say, oh, well, I can't do this. And with that, like, I was raised kind of like a little bit of both African American as well as indigenous. Mm -hmm. and my mother, even though my father was like, don't eat pork in my house, they divorced, she was like, screw you, <laughs> you did whatever you wanted. So is it more of the, like, the way that you're raised as far as how you eat in your diet? So not, a, it's a good thought, but like for example, not exactly, but yeah, certain types of diets, we know like a high salt diet will predispose us to having higher blood pressures because salt, you retain water and it increases your blood pressure. But in particularly, um, they think that there is a gene that um, African Americans may carry that may make you more sensitive to salt and sodium. And so that might be one of the reasons why African American patients experience higher blood pressures is because of this gene that makes you more sensitive to salt. Okay, so that's one of the factors that we could consider. Okay, all right, so you guys were right, smoking, contributes to high blood pressures, right? Eating too much salt, there you go. Stress, that roach on the floor. <laughs> alcohol, excessive alcohol intake can develop, uh, lead to developing high blood pressures and a sedentary lifestyle, yeah. you know, being inactive. Excuse yeah. me, he saw a roach too, I think. Cigarettes. Oh, sorry, what did you say? Cigarettes too? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Thirty. No, thirty. All right, but like since I was seventeen. All right, so that's about forty years. Cause I'd be fifty-nine. Mm-hmm. But I still have low blood pressure. 
You're lucky. That's not the case for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So additional risk factors is increasing or advancing age. As we get older, we are more pre predisposed to developing high blood pressure. We talked about race. African Americans in particular are more prone to developing high blood pressure. Family history is another risk factor. So if you have multiple people in your family who suffer from high blood pressure, you may be one of the other unlucky ones to also deal with this. Um, and weight. So overweight and obese patients definitely, definitely are at higher risk of developing higher blood pressure. You know, you're right. I am lucky. <laughs> no, but seriously, because as time went on, some people in my family developed diabetes, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I am lucky. Yeah. I didn't eat all the things that they were eating. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so can anyone here tell me what a normal blood pressure is? Um, I know, I tried to, it's, it's, not as, it's not as blank I wanted it to be. 120 over 80. 120 over 80, that was a close one, but 120 over, see now it's lit up. 120 over 80 is what we consider to be a normal blood pressure. So if that's a normal, that's it, it was a good guess. Yes, go ahead. What's the other that's millimeters of mercury. So that's what we use to, that's the unit that we use to measure blood pressure. Okay. So if that's normal blood pressure, what do we consider to be high blood pressure? Any guesses? 121 over 81. <laughs> Close. Even though it's not really high blood pressure, but you're over the recommended. We'll talk about that. That's a good guess. 140 over 140 over that's definitely a high blood pressure. That's uh, okay. So those are all great guesses. So let's talk about this. So high blood pressure comes in two stages, right? So the first stage that we consider high blood pressure is anything between the top number being 130 to 139, and the bottom number being between 80 to 89. And the second stage of hypertension, we consider anything greater than 140 over 90. So for the person who said 121 over 81, is that considered a high blood pressure? No, we, we allow for a little bit of, of give and take up until we hit those certain markers, so certain numbers, okay? So when you start hitting 130 to 139 and 80 to 89, that's when your doctor is gonna start talking to you about your blood pressures. Now, about a year ago, 133 was considered good. Could you explain that? So there's been recent studies that have kind of changed the shift in what we identify as high blood pressure, and we, based on those studies, we now recommend treating these numbers as hypertension. We may not be as aggressive with our approach with these numbers, but we this is definitely the stage at which we start to talk about what are some of the things we can do to start lowering your blood pressure. Okay, so with any state not necessarily and we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about the symptoms because you may not necessarily experience any symptoms with a blood pressure over 140 over 90. sure a little low I'm sorry, can you, uh-huh. It happened to me a couple of times. It happened to me more times when my blood pressure was lower than it was supposed to be and it was higher than it was supposed to be. Sure. And what's that? What's the problem with that? So if your blood pressure is on the lower side, it might be that maybe you're a little dehydrated, maybe you need to eat a little something. But I thought so, yeah. Yeah, and honestly, Honestly, yeah. even if you're lower than 120 over 80, some people live at numbers a little bit lower than 120 over 80, and that's I've their normal. That, I've heard that a lot. Yep. Yeah, they, like, your blood pressure is kind of low right now. I've heard it more than my blood pressure is high. I think it matters more if you're not feeling well and your blood pressure is low. Usually it's like really hot and humid, like dehydrated all Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's why I do those symptoms. I'm like, usually that's my blood pressure doesn't really check out the right place. Exactly. And so that should be an indicator for you to rest and hydrate and go to a cool place if it's hot outside. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I would put that like he did, but I almost passed out at the time when it happened to me. Oh, that's so My right. blood pressure had really... I it seemed like everything just got so heavy. Mm -hmm. Okay, they took me down to Einstein and they said they couldn't find nothing wrong, just that my salt intake level was low. Sure. 
And that's... They said I wasn't dehydrated. So my salt would take about three months. Sure, because, rem okay, so remember, our, our body loves salt. And how do we get high blood pressure is, you know, water, exactly. So if your salt level is low, then that could probably contribute to you being at a lower blood pressure level. Does that mean good for you? Like my friend, we worked at Walmart for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. We worked in the trucks and unloading trucks. He got really hot and sweaty. He was every bit of probably like 275. When he drank his water, he'd always put a, like, a gram or two of salt in it. Does that help you for you? Uh, probably a gram or two of salt is probably not good to add to your water. And we'll talk about that, but we shouldn't really be adding extra salt to, to our foods or to our drinks. Excuse me, just regular spring water. Yeah. What was your question? No, that's what he was adding the salt to, like regular spring Why was he doing that? Do you know? Because he worked in truck, he worked unloading trucks, and there was no air circulating, no anything. He'd be there for hours and hours and hours, and he'd just feel like totally hydrated, you know, it's like, I would probably, I would probably emphasize more drinking a lot of water versus adding salt to your water. Well, even 50 years ago, we were across country, or after football class or basketball class, they would give you a salt pack. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? About 50 years ago, uh -huh. after, after practice, they would give you a salt pack. Makes sense, because when you are... When you are exercising and you're outside, right, we lose electrolytes in our sweat. We lose some salt, right? We lose different um, nutrients through when we're exercising a lot. So that's where things like Gatorade and different kinds of drinks that have some of these electrolytes in there to replenish. So for a normal person that's not really exerting themselves to, to that kind of a level, Hydrating with normal water is, is reasonable, but for a person who is athletic, that's running a lot, that's doing a lot of type of physical activity, then I think that's where things like adding a little bit of extra nutrients and salt may help in those scenarios. So. So I think that, yeah. I think the tricky part is. And it sounds like that's very heavy exertional work. I think the trick. No circulation of air anywhere. Right. Air in the middle of factory, just under the trucks for like four or five hours a day at a time. I think the tricky part becomes knowing how much to put in, right? And so that's, it may not be the wrong thing to do, but I think it's, it's tricky to make sure that you're getting the right amount and not too much, because with too much, you can cause a different set of problems. Excuse me? It does, it can. You have to eat? Um, if you can try eating, I don't think that not eating, if your blood pressure is high, yeah, I don't know. I meant to say, does it, does my blood pressure cause, cause, come by not eating? Does high blood pressure come by not eating? Not necessarily. Okay, because every time I get a headache, somebody says, well, maybe you gotta eat. And you, no. does it help when you eat? No. So. Oh, I don't remember the name of the term where you're overhydrated, but I've heard of it before. When you have too much water mm -hmm. or something in your body, it's just basically you have to have a happy meal. That's the first thing. The second thing, when she was talking about eating something, I think they might have confused her high blood pressure versus high or low blood sugar. Exactly. Because I know I've had that meat since I was three. Mm -hmm. If I don't eat, there's been a time when I had to be handcuffed and hog tied mm -hmm. because I was violent. And it wasn't my conscious thing. I had a, a severe low blood sugar. Right. And people were like, she's just on drugs or something. I'm not in my right frame of mind. I need to eat something. Get some honey in my face or something. <laughs> but even with that whole situation, with the high blood pressure versus high blood sugar, people will say one thing and not know, well, no, diabetes is a different situation than blood pressure and salt. Uh, yes, there's... With the headaches, like low blood sugar, I've got pounding headaches. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the salt situation with high blood pressure. 
But you're right. So the symptoms of, you know, when you're when you have a low blood sugar and you feel dizzy or lightheaded or you have a headache and in that scenario where your blood sugar is low, eating is definitely going to help and probably resolve some of your symptoms. But with the high blood pressure, could that happen with the headaches? Well, you can have headaches with high blood pressure, but I don't think that it necessarily resolves by eating things that contain salts or any kinds of foods. Okay. Yeah. It may or may not, but not. I would not tell someone with a headache and high blood pressure, hey, go eat some salt, it's going to fix it. Uh, yeah. um, that brings up the question, I mean, you mentioned salt, but what about sugar in this oh, yeah. system, like sodas, and is, how does that tie in with uh, high blood pressure? So, you know, sugar, so a lot of people who have high blood pressure, sometimes they're not just dealing with high blood pressure. They may have other illnesses like diabetes, um, high cholesterol. And so when you add all of these things together, obviously it's, it, you're, it makes the patient a lot sicker, right? So in terms of sodas, obviously you're at, talking to a doctor, I don't recommend any sodas or add, you know, they have a lot of sugars in them and that can predispose you to other illnesses. But Patients who have one illness like hypertension, sometimes they may have other illnesses as well. I don't know if that answered your question, but hopefully that helps. Okay. Are we ready to move to the next slide? Yes? yes? Okay. All right. So the, this leads us to, well, we talked a little bit about the numbers, right? So how many of you guys know what these numbers actually mean? I don't remember what systolic means, but I've heard it before. Okay. So the top number is our systolic blood pressure. And every t you know every time you feel your heart beat, that's your heart contracting. Every time your heart beats, it's your heart pumping the blood out into your arteries. So that's when that heart is pumping at that moment, the pressure in your arteries when your heart is contracting is what the top number represents, okay? The bottom number we call diastolic blood pressure and that is the moment when your heart is completely relaxed and all that blood is filling right back into your heart and that's the pressure we measure at that moment, okay? What happens when your heart beats fast? What happens when your heart beats fast? So when your heart beats, when your heart beats really fast, we worry that your heart is not pumping out a sufficient amount of blood to supply the different parts of your body. Yours does that all the time? Have you seen your doctor? Yeah, that's that's scary. I mean, You'll be. It could be due to anxiety, but it could be due to other things. That's very scary when we feel our heart beating. Yeah, it's important to talk to your doctor so that they can help sort out why you might be experiencing that and to to think about different things that we can do to help with that. That sounds scary, yeah. What do we do after one too many what? Lactates. Lactates? Lactates. Because I knew they definitely drive your blood pressure away. It can't be a cold cold. It can't happen. I don't drink too many sodas, but coffee has always been number one. We often all need our coffee to function, right? What is the only thing that's slowing down faster? So. Is water the only thing that can slow down your yeah. your high blood pressure? Is that what your yeah. question is? Yeah, because that's only time mine's really high. Like, if I just go forward, I want to call you not here, you know, things like that. What I would recommend is probably cutting back on the amount of caffeine that you're mm -hmm. drinking because. Mm -hmm. That's kind of hard to measure sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Like, because certain coffee, certain brands, certain strengths are. It's hard to measure. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Absolutely. Like, so too late, you've had enough. Absolutely. Things so, are start being two, three hundred miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. We would hope that that would pass as the caffeine passes through your body, but if it's something that's sustained, obviously you should go get checked out. But also, if you're someone who likes to drink seven, eight, nine cups of some kind of caffeine a day and you're experiencing these kinds of symptoms, then I think at that point, even if you can't measure what has more caffeine and what has less caffeine, maybe starting by just reducing the amount of cups of something that you're drinking might be a good thing to start trying to do. I could about three, four. One day I had like one cup of coffee. I don't know. What was in that coffee? <laughs> Espresso. I drink that. 
and a can of vegetables. That was my usual for like a six, a, six hours out of my work day. Mm-hmm. By the time I got to work, I was kidding drink anything else with caffeine the rest of the day. My heart was pumping so fast. Mm-hmm. For an hour or two, I was like, and you have to be really I careful. You have to be really careful because that can be dangerous to you. I was like, the air. I was like, okay, everything else I do today is water. Water is catering. Mm-hmm. And that's and good. I drink, and like, oh, God, that was 12 ounces. I'm like, I don't do 12 ounces. Like, I go through that about every hour or two. So first of all, I think the important thing from what I take away from what you're telling me is that you're someone who experiences when you have too much caffeine, your heart starts racing. And it stays yeah. for a while. So... I think you know what your trigger is, so that's, that's important, and to start working towards trying to cut back on it. And two, if it's something that doesn't go away within a certain period of time, or if it's making it very uncomfortable, then it's better to get checked out and make sure you're okay than to sit and wait for it to get worse. It, well, once the caffeine wears out, you might have a little bit of a crash afterwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, I it's possible. I know somebody who's a younger person and he drinks coffee like it's water. You know what I mean? Now he knows that he's built up a tolerance. I've never asked him, well, what's your blood pressure or anything like that? Is it possible to have enough caffeine where your body's just like, ah, oh, this is not good enough? It's or possible. It depends on the person as far as their situation. I think but it's. Practice medicine, not I think it varies from person to person. Of what energy drinks? No. Yeah, no. Yeah, because I think a lot of those um, drinks have a, a really large quantity, concentrated quant uh, part of um, concentrated caffeine in them, and we don't know what that is going to have an, what kind of effect that's going to have on your body and that's why these drinks have warning labels on them right it can precipitate your heart racing it can precipitate a heart attack you know so i don't recommend taking them especially when you're older and have other uh, medical conditions as well you can precipitate something really bad happening and to my knowledge they are not yeah People drink it, that's why it's sold, but we don't recommend them. Yeah. It tastes like cough syrup, so I don't really like it. Yeah, I don't like it either, but it still does nothing to me. I'm like, yeah, Are we ready to move on to the next slide, you guys? Yeah. All right, so we talked a little bit about this, so what are some symptoms? Well, this goes back to the point someone asked me. Most people may not experience any kind of symptoms with high blood pressure, which is why it's often regarded as a silent killer, right? So which is, which is scary, because you may walk around and not really know that you even have, have high blood pressure. Less often, people will complain about things like headaches, feeling fatigued, maybe having some vision changes, feeling a little dizzy. You may even experience some chest pain or shortness of breath. Um, some people also experience nosebleeds. So you may have one of these symptoms. You may have none of these symptoms. You may have a multitude of these symptoms. It really depends on person to person. You know what? I really can't tell because I'm a diabetic as well. Mm -hmm. I go through the headaches, the, the nerves, the dizziness, mm -hmm. and the chest pains and stuff like that. So it's really hard for me to say if I'm having an attack or, or, or anything because I just think it's my uh, diabetes. Sure. It makes... I'm, I'm just going to get a doctor and every little thing. My kids be like, Mom, you a hypochondriac. <laughs> 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 every little pain or if I can't see or uh, my chest or if I call them and tell them to take it to have Mom, you ain't nothing wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> but this time it was uh, so they could have seen it no more. I told them to stop calling me a hypochondriac. I think it becomes harder because you are, you're dealing with different medical illnesses and so it's harder to figure out what is okay and what's not. And in those scenarios, I say it's better to be safe than sorry. And if you, and then talking with your doctor who knows you better than any one of us in the room, helping to identify what symptoms are more emergent than not, that's something over time. But if I was in your scenario, I would probably say, let's go get it checked out because you never know.
right? I think he was next, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, now for me, um, all of them except for the last two. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have been experiencing those three even at a young age. So even now when I experience it, I don't know if it's from me having low blood pressure, uh, growing the age old thing, mm -hmm. or what. How often do you get your blood pressure checked? When you're having those symptoms, okay. When you're having those symptoms, do you have access to a blood pressure machine at home or a cuff at home? Or um, when you have symptoms like this, what, what might be helpful is if you have a cuff or like a local uh, Rite Aid or CVS that is nearby, they always have these cuffs available. So it would be probably helpful to get it checked when you're experiencing those symptoms and then you can, you can kind of see, well, is my blood pressure normal? Is it high? Is it low? So that might kind of help explain things a little bit better. Yes, sir. Um, several months ago, there was a leading African-American director of telephone, John Hamilton, that dropped dead. And it was because he didn't know when he was hypertensive. Sure. He was 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So that night, the news outlets started doing these national reports on the silent killer syndrome. So, okay, so for you as a doctor, what would you suggest to African-American in general, specifically as to the silent killer factor being there, and you could just be affected automatically without any symptoms that mm -hmm. Is there an advice you can lend or sure. what do you say? I think it's important, and we're going to talk about this as we move on, but I think it's important to lead a healthy lifestyle as much as possible, right? If there is a risk factor that is beyond your control, I think it's important to make sure that you're checking your blood pressure regularly. It's important to be checking in with your doctor regularly, especially if you know you're someone who's at risk for developing this. But in general, I think aside from those things, it's really important to make sure that you are being as healthy as possible, watching your diet, making sure you're exercising, um, you know, avoiding a cutting back on caffeine and alcohol and smoking. And these are things that I'm going to mention later on, but that would be the best advice I could give, give to you is sometimes this is unavoidable and this occurs because of factors beyond our control. But if to allow, to allow us to have some control, I would recommend trying to implement a healthy lifestyle as much as possible and not ignoring your health, right? I don't know what you a blood pressure cuff. So when you go to your doctor's office, what do they use oh, to measure? Sorry, a blood pressure cuff. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Does a hoagie count as a salad? No. Does a hoagie count as a salad? I'm sorry, Kevin. I'm having hearing difficulty. Yeah, you said hoagie. The same components that go with hoagie go in a salad. So does a hoagie count as a salad? Does a hoagie count as a salad? Well, a chef salad. Yeah, a chef salad, that is. Yeah, if you yeah, have well, a yeah, some, kind of, some kind of protein and all the vegetables. Yeah. I think the problem. The same concept. I think the problem well, with hoagie, the hoagie. Does it give a difference in the bread? <laughs> exactly. Well, well, well most places that give you a salad, they give you bread with your salad. Or right. And, but I think, so yes, if you get a salad and you're opting to get the bread with it, then the salad isn't really as effective as we want it to be. And I think the difference between the hoagie and the salad comes is we get a lot of bread and everything else that goes into, this, into the hoagie versus with the salad, you might be able to pick healthier things that go in it. Actually, I'm from South Philly. Nope. You got to take all the middle out the bread, okay. cut the ends off, and then you put the hoagie in. Then That's a good strategy. <laughs> That's like, a good strategy. Like everything in the middle, too much bread. Take a while, cut the ends off, what's left over, then you make me sandwich. Mm. Don't eat the salad in those types of places. Because when you have the salad and you see it displayed nicely, you notice how green it is and how nice the vegetables are. Sure. And it's not turning brown. It's because it's sprayed with salt water. Oh, that, I did not know that, actually. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good tip. I did not know that. Well, I, I think it's the processed meat that's the problem. Because that's not uh, yeah. It has salt. tons of salt in there. Yeah, that's Absolutely. That's what I hate about it. So yes. If you make a hoagie at home, you can use fresh things. But I would, I you know, recommend, right, this is pretty healthy. Uh, yes, and I think that's an excellent comment. Yes, yeah. absolutely. 
I would have guessed, he said salt water. I would have never known that. Yeah. I would have guessed it was like Monsanto, but genetically modified crap. No, it's all sprayed in once we salt water purposely okay. to keep it fresh. I'm so glad you said that. I think we're all going to be more cognizant of that now, water. right? You sprayed it with fresh water with <laughs> ice on it, but you never put salt in water. No, it would, it would, it would it's like oxidize without the salt. Uh-oh. That's going to keep us out of fresh Okay, so now we're going to move on to talking a little bit about the effects of blood pressure, high blood pressure. So for us to kind of have a more broad conversation about this, I think it's important that we talk about what blood pressure does on a microscopic level in our body. So what you see the picture just showing is basically normal, like what these little arteries, the inside of those arteries look like, right? So in a normal person, in a healthy individual, that's on the, all the way to the left is a normal artery with normal blood flow through it. <clears throat> now, a person who is suffering from hypertension, over time, that blood pressure can start to damage the inside lining of our arteries. And as you can see, the edges become really rough. Um, they, the blood flow through is more turbulent. It's not flowing as smoothly. And then you have you have normal amounts of fatty deposits and lipids that flow through your blood that we accumulate through our diet. And those, fat, that, those fats in our blood see these uneven edges and they, they, they like to stick onto them, right? Can you as a doctor, can you see, the, can you see this in a patient? We can't visibly see this in a patient, no, because these are really little tiny, so we would probably have to look at them under a microscope to even be able to see them. Yep. But is this graph So it all plays into each other. So this, this, we can expect a person with heart disease to have some, to have arteries that look like this. So again, I didn't say that person with heart disease is not heart disease. It depends on the cause of heart disease, but we do see that patients who have hypertension often have some sort of heart disease later on as it progresses. Yeah. Okay. So does everyone kind of see how those, see how the how over time the structure inside the artery starts to change, it becomes narrower, it becomes harder for blood to flow through the arteries, right? Okay, so this leads me to my next slide. So if you think at the microscopic level what's going on with our arteries, now this is a, this is a picture of overall global things that, can affect, that hypertension can lead to in our body. So if we look at the picture, we see that the top picture is Hypertension can lead to a stroke, which we talked about a little bit earlier, and that's because, you know, it could, one of the reasons we could have a stroke uh, due to hypertension is because as those arteries become harder for blood to flow through, it decreases blood supply to our, our, uh, our brain, and that can cause a stroke. Um, same thing with our eyes. We have arteries supplying blood to our eyes, and if those <laughs> arteries start, are damaged or narrow, we could have vision loss. Um, a heart attack because even our heart has arteries that supply blood to our heart muscle to make sure it's pumping. So if in a heart attack what happens, those arteries get occluded and there's decreased blood supply to that muscle and that's what we call a heart attack. If your heart is having a really hard time pumping blood out of the heart because of the damage to the arteries, it can cause our heart to fail because it's working so harder and it's getting tired and it can cause changes to the structure of the heart. Same thing with our kidneys. Um, you know, we can have a lot of kidney failure, different kinds of kidney diseases, and even sexual dysfunction because our sexual organs also receive blood supply to function properly. So men and women alike can experience some form of sexual dysfunction as a result of hypertension, which can be very frustrating. So those, on a, those are some of the most common things we see. The list to the left shows you some more specific um, things that I may not have covered in the picture. So a stroke, so a TIA is a mini stroke, which usually is, is, has symptoms that sometimes fade away. Um, but yes, it's a form of a, it's a mini stroke, exactly. Yeah, I have one of those, um, and the doctor came to me and she told me that in the morning I will have a massive migraine mm. because the little small so-called tension headaches the doctors kept rubbing off all those years mm -hmm. with small migraines. Mm. Mm. That's a thing I wouldn't even give to one of my 
Yeah, that's it's um, tough. I'm gonna bring the elephant in the room. Sure. Uh, because I'm just I feel dysfunction. I've been told that erectile dysfunction occurs a lot of men who don't know they are hypersensitive. Sure. And they have no idea because they're young, maybe. Or older, but they don't tie it in. So can you, is that something you find out too late? Sexually because you're thinking of your perform, you're not performing, but you don't think it's hypertension. Exactly. So how do you make the connection? You, how you make the connection is you go see your, you have your blood pressure checked, right? Well, you're not sexually it's a, it's part if you're not function if your sexual function is declining and we don't know why. There's a lot of different things we need to check to kind of get to the answer, because even though hypertension leads to sexual dysfunction, it's not the only cause for sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So for us to be able to, if you notice that you're having difficulty, then that's the next step of getting your blood pressure checked and talking to your doctor about what kinds of different causes mm -hmm. could. Be leading to this. Okay. Yes, sir. Would you not know that you were having a TIA? You, you, will, you would likely, most people likely experience some sort of a symptom where they might have some kind of slurred speech or they might have some difficulty with vision or their face looks a little droopy or they're having a hard time walking or moving. It might, it well, it might be. So with the TIA, the symptoms may fade quickly. With a stroke, the symptoms can last and be more permanent, right? So yes, people may experience a TIA and not even know that they had one. Uh, you ain't lying. <laughs> I didn't know I was having one the night I was, I was in a shelter um, waiting on my housing. And luckily for me, she was a nurse. In our room, mm -hmm. and I just kept this gun is going down my arm, right? both my arms. So I just, you know, because I know I have also have poor blood circulation. So I just shoved it off, right? And then next, you know, you said the vision, and then it seemed like everything just turned a blurry white. So I just, you know, I was just steady watching TV, and she looked over at me and she said, "Girl," she said, "Um, from the looks of what you just did." She said, you need to go to the hospital when you have a stroke. Mm. It's good she that she right. found you. Mm. She was right. Yeah. There were two subjects I wanted to work with. First, Joe was talking about certain things and symptoms of ever talking to him. He smokes like a chimney. He refuses to give up cigarettes, but he likes to have sex. But the thing is, not to be so versatile, I'm not going to say his name, but he does not last long because of the so many cigarettes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. you know, or he will ejaculate quickly. And that's the issue. Uh, Mm -hmm. the, the regarding that, as far as the TIA, I've had them, mm -hmm. but it is like an exact stroke. Mm -hmm. One part, I mean, a half of my body mm -hmm. at work. I had to drag myself out to my mother's basement floor. Mm -hmm. Scared the skin off me. Absolutely. I thought it was like a full fledged stroke. I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die. You know, and people don't realize, and I didn't realize that it was all the salt that I also had taken in. I'm thinking the shift, I didn't have enough sugar in my system, or I didn't eat enough. Mm -hmm. But it was probably the added combating salt that's really trying to do the trick. Also, <laughs> I'm still here. I had a blood sugar of 20 on Saturday. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to alien from a different planet because I'm still kicking. But with it, a lot of people don't understand. You're doing a lot of damage to your body if you're not trying to be moderated and everything. Mm -hmm. Even if you smoke cigarettes or not a drink to get drunk, whatever, you have to learn how to raise it off or cut off. Exactly. Balance up. Instead of a cigarette, have some water or some of my ice cubes or something. Sure. You know, and, and sometimes it's an oral fixation, you know. It's hard. I mean, I've had patients come to, it's, it's not easy to give up cigarettes, yeah. but when a person decides they're ready, then there's a lot of different ways that we can come up with a plan to help you help you reach that goal. They say it's harder to quit than heroin. I believe it, yeah. Can you speak more about the relationship between the high blood pressure and dementia? Sure. So there are certain types of dementia that 
um, are related to our blood supply, right? So um, as we see those changes to the arteries that are happening in our, in our brain as well, that can be a precursor to developing certain types of dementia. Because, you know, as your brain is globally receiving a reduced amount of blood, that's going to affect the way that we mentate and the way we're able to function. There's not just one form of dementia, there's different types, and dementia related to high blood pressure certainly can happen. Yes, sir? Well, and stress is, um, I, it's not up here, but I think that, I, I think the research on um, sexual dysfunction is because um, men go crazy without it, but it's very, mainly because they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. People are kind of stressed out, and you've got to find a way to, to reduce the stress level. And sure. And when you're stressed, I mean, I they don't even take a blood pressure um, when you're stressed out, right? You would, but it's not, you have to prepare to take a blood pressure. Mm -hmm. so, um, and you should be, find ways to relax yourself. Right? Absolutely. That's what they, and unfortunately, I'm, without naming these, the number one drug in the world, the number one uh, pill in the world is for sexual dysfunction. Absolutely. Um, but the side effects are, again, it's stress. It completely, I think it increases the blood flow, right? Which is not healthy. Yeah, the and pill will help increase the blood flow, yes. yes. And so that, that causes more harm, um, plus it leads to blindness. So that, In certain scenarios, yes, it, no true. medication comes without risk, right? Right, right, right. so, like sex, <laughs> 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 All right, okay, so the next slide here is, this leads into our next topic, right? How do we treat it? Here's a list of medications. How many of you guys have heard of some of these? These are some of the common medications. Hydrochlorothiazide, Lisinopril, Losartan, yeah. So these are very common medications that your doctor may use to help treat your high blood pressure. We use a different combination of these depending on what specifically we're trying to help you with and what we think the source of your high blood pressure may be based on side effects that you may experience with one or maybe one medication isn't working as well. So you may have be on one medication or any combination of these medications to help treat your high blood pressure. Yes? I was going to mention you about stress and sexual function, um, I hate to be the one who's the advocate for masturbation, but <laughs> seriously, if you can bring yourself to orgasm, more power to you. You know, people say, "Oh, I want a woman." Okay, I understand that. Or I want a man. I understand that. Or I want, you know, whatever gender that you like. Whatever, no problem. But if you have to be self-sustaining, that could also help to reduce the stress. I'm not saying everybody, but. I'll be, after I can do that, and I'm good to go. Other people are like, well, you want a toy. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to tell you exactly how I do things, but in that regard, it's very stress reducing as far as that. And different people have different methods of relieving yeah. stress, and I think whatever works for you to help reduce your stress, that is, that's key, yeah. is finding what works for you. All right, is it okay if I move to the next, next slide? So obviously medications are the biggest way and most you know, that we treat hypertension, but there's also a lot of different ways that we can treat and prevent hypertension. So one of the things I touched on earlier was maintaining a healthy weight, right? So we recommend about 150 minutes of exercise in the course of a week. Well, you guys might think that's a lot of time. If you break it down, this is about 30 minutes five times a week. And this is some kind of an activity that gets your heart going. It can be anything you like, but you know, things that we as doctors like to see is jogging, cycling, walking, swimming, dancing. But really, this could be anything that you like that gets your heart going, and you want to sustain that for about 30 minutes. And this leads to not only sustaining heart health, but also helps you maintain a healthy weight and also maybe even helps you lose weight to get to a healthy weight. Okay. And the next part of that is maintaining a healthy diet. And we talked a little bit about this during our discussion. There's a lot of different things we can do. I'm going to talk about the DASH diet in the next, next slide. But this is uh, something that has been studied very well. And we recommend um, to our, our patients who are developing hypertension or at risk for hypertension or even have hypertension to help control it. Um, we, recommend in, uh, we recommend eating foods with uh, good potassium amounts in them because we know that potassium can help counter the effects of sodium. Things that are rich in potassium, foods are bananas, avocados, oranges, there's a whole slew of them out there. Um, 
but eating a healthy amount of that would be helpful. And also keeping a food diary that helps us identify how much are we eating, what are we eating, why are we eating that, so that we can identify the behaviors that lead to poor eating choices and try to work on changing those. Okay, yes sir? I agree. All the fresh stuff, and I know it's hard. What'd you say? Fresh or frozen. Yeah. All right, I think we're, those are great questions. I'm going to move on to the next slide and we'll, t we'll have a few minutes for questions afterwards. I just want to make sure we cover some of the important things. The DASH diet more specifically is a dietary approach to stop hypertension. We emphasize whole grains, fruit, vegetables, and low-fat dairy. To start with, we want to limit our sodium intake to less than 2,300 milligrams per day, which is very difficult, right? An average American consumes about 3,600 milligrams of sodium a day. And so if you're really trying to lower your sodium, how do you do that? You want to make sure you're reading your food labels, eating less processed foods, canned, right, and packaged, and trying to avoid adding extra salt to our foods. If you're able to sustain this and stick to this, you can lower your blood pressure from 8 to 14 points, ideally, which is great, right? And this is without medication. Other ways is obviously we talk about limiting alcohol intake. For women in general, we say one drink per day. For men, we say less than two drinks per day will help. And quitting smoking, right? Reducing your stress levels. We talked a little bit about different ways that people like to reduce their stress. Um, so finding things that help you relax and doing them more often, cutting back on caffeine. Moderate consumption is okay. We know that some amounts during the day are okay, but we have to be careful about how much we're taking in and what we're drinking. Okay, and most importantly, it's important to check in with your doctor regularly, you know, check your blood pressure, make sure we're, we're maintaining a healthy lifestyle and working, with the, working on your doctors with figuring out a plan to to help tackle any challenges that may come up. Okay? Thank you all for your attention. I'm here for any questions if, if you have any. Yes, sir. I, I think that's, I um, like to switch the way we eat. I think it's uh, like three big meals a day and you're full and you don't exercise or wait for them. Sure. And measure to like five smaller meals throughout the day. Sure. But once I start to do that, mm -hmm. um, it was easy to kind of um, uh, you know, well, I'm the, the controversial question. I think um, I'm an advocate of marijuana. Sure. Um, as a form of relaxation, because it's almost impossible to get riled up when sure. you're smoking good marijuana. <laughs> so I, and I know that the research is out there, but I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And I don't think it has as many side effects. Um, and I know the research, I, I you know, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to get a farm of marijuana, so I'm also a plus. So I think, I think from a medical standpoint, we haven't really studied it well enough to know what, what a lot of the effects can be over a long period of time. But we know that you know, marijuana is approved for different reasons. And one of the reasons in Pennsylvania, marijuana is approved for use is for anxiety. Um, so you know, if that's something that helps you, then talking to your doctor about that and seeing if that's something that is helpful for you, I think you know, that's, that's reasonable. So oh, I want to see Marinol pills. Marinol pills? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it has a little bit in there. That, that makes you eat. Yes, sir. If alcohol is bad on the surface, why does your slide say it's okay for men to have children? So we know that studies have shown that alcohol consumption up to those limits is what we think is okay. Excessive alcohol consumption beyond that is what we worry about in terms of development of other medical problems such as hypertension. I, yeah, so in general, one drink per woman and one, two drinks for men because we metabolize things a little differently. So that's, that's why we kind of st uh, stick to that 
as a general rule of thumb. I, I, do you ever come off of it? Is that what your question is? I've taken plenty of patients off of high blood pressure medications. Yep. <laughs> I would love to. It doesn't have to be permanent. It depends on what, it depends on how hard you're working to control some of the other risk factors we talked about. And I have seen patients with really high blood pressures. It's hard, but I have seen patients who are really motivated, able to do lifestyle changes. And, you know, we start by working on checking your blood pressure off it. And if you're working towards it, and as your blood pressure declines, then we start to taper you off of your medicine. And eventually, if you're, if you're looking good, we can take you off the medicine. It doesn't have to always be permanent. Yeah. Yes, sir. Emily, I'll this same scale. Uh, really okay. okay. Well, this rule is true. But they said it really does affect the Who said that? Hey, about five different doctors over like 20 something years. And my blood pressure really never changes. Mm -hmm. My blood pressure went up maybe like 30, 40 points over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say when I was 15, 19, my blood pressure was everything like 220. So I. Yeah, this was every bit of two seconds. So. I'm like, that's kind of, that ain't pushing for 25 years. Ago. So I think there, it's. It, my blood pressure always, like, if I put them on medicine for the cholesterol. So with the. Still saw, still saw it necessary. Sure. For me to take it. Because my blood pressure never went. So. For cholesterol, right? There's different types of cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol, right? And a lot of times doctors look at the breakdown of what kind of cholesterol there is and they are able to calculate, use other parts of your medical history to help calculate what your risk of developing heart disease is based on your blood pressure, based on your cholesterol levels. And based on that, they're able to say, okay, well, medicine might be helping this, this patient or a medicine may not be helpful to this patient. So. The numbers itself don't speak for itself. It's yeah. it's an overall assessment of yeah. well, they, what they, they particular told, numbers are high and low. Because I, I told the, uh, the new doctors that only had like a year or two, I'm like, the previous doctor told me that I really shouldn't take cholesterol medication. Yeah, and it, it really depends on what those so numbers are. Sure. Is, is all, everything sure. Is out somewhere along the line. Sure. I'm like, look, my cholesterol is on like those 220, 230, and I was 19. Sure. I'm 40 something now. Mm hmm. That's not really that dramatic, but it increases with 20 Right. Can we take one more question? Okay. I'll take the last two questions. Okay, great. All right. Yes, go ahead. I'm going to go with her first. Sorry. Okay. Um, I've been taking high blood pressure pills when I was 21. Mm hmm. I'm 62 now. Mm hmm. And I'm tired of taking that. Really, I am. I'm sure. Hydrochlorothiazide? I think if I know it's probably really stressful to be tied to medications for such a long period of time. I can't imagine how frustrating that is. I don't understand. You be on something for so long, it doesn't work anymore. So it might be working. Right? right? If you're still on it, maybe. My is 300. Mm. Mm. So before you make any decisions to stop any of your medications, I think it's important to voice your frustrations to the doctor that's taking care of you to help them help you make a decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people don't. Sure. It sounds really stressful. <laughs> Last question. My doctor, at the time I was seeing a family, a regular practitioner, was stating, your cholesterol is 150. That's half of what hers was. And I'm looking at them because they're like, 
your flush your flush costs too high. And I'm like, 150? Are you on something? And they were like, as a diabetic. And I'm like, I've had this since I was three. I'm not a big person who eats fatty foods, mm -hmm. so why they told me this gets me on my it varies from patient to patient, right? And that's because in general, so because you have diabetes, the cutoff for what is an acceptable limit for cholesterol is very different than someone who doesn't have diabetes. Because when you add different illnesses to high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, it puts you more at risk for really severe illnesses and outcomes, right? So just because 150 may be acceptable for another patient and it's not acceptable for you, it's because you may have other things that are contributing to a more stringent cutoff for your doctor. So what's true for you will probably never be true for another person because that other person is dealing with a different set of things than you are. Okay? No. You're welcome.